So how does the clock work? So as we stand facing the clock, we can see that the mechanism is contained within a cage of iron bars called a bird cage. And it's interesting to note that the iron bars are not held together by nuts and bolts, but by a woodworking technique of mortise and tenon joints. The clock mechanism itself is divided into two parts. The right hand side is called the going train, and this is the bit that keeps the time. And the left hand side is called the striking train, and this is the bit that strikes the bell every hour. The going train is driven by the small weight that falls throughout the day, causing the wheels to go round once every hour before activating the striking train. Now if the weight was allowed to fall on its own accord, it would just fall from start to finish and then that would be the end of it. So there needs to be a braking mechanism which controls the rate at which the weight falls. And this is called the verge and foliate escapement. The verge is a long straight rod that goes through the centre of the clock and it gets its name from the verge that our vergers hold to lead the clergy into services. The foliate is the U-shaped bar which sits on top of the verge at 90 degrees and it has weights on the edges of the foliate to control the rate of which it rotates. The verge itself has two metal pallets on it which collide with the teeth of the crown wheel. So as the weight falls it causes the driving wheel to go round once an hour. The driving wheel in turn causes the, the crown wheel to rotate and as the crown wheel rotates the teeth collide with the pallets on the verge and they cause the verge to rotate which in turn causes the foliate to rotate and the weights on the foliate control the rate at which it rotates. And in this way we control and regulate time. When the clock was created the day was divided into 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. Now obviously during the summer this meant that the, the hours of daylight were longer in the summer than they were in the winter. So they had to have some way of changing the rate of rotation. And these were the weights on the foliate called cursor. If we move the weights to the outside of the foliate, the foliate rotates more slowly and if we move the weights into the centre of the foliate, the foliate rotates faster. And in this way, we control the rate at which the, ro the foliate rotates, and hence the rate at which the clock ticks. On the great wheel of the driving train, we can see that there's a small peg. And as the great wheel goes round once every hour, at the end of the hour, this peg collides with a nag's head and a lever. The peg causes the nag's head to straighten and it continues to straighten until it won't straighten anymore and then it causes the lever to lift up causing the iron bar at the back of the clock to rotate and hence releasing the striking train. The iron bar at the back of the clock has three levers connected to it, one which goes to the driving train and two which go to the striking train. Once the strike mechanism has been released by the lifting of the two levers, the large weight causes the great wheel on the striking train to rotate. And we can see that the wheel has eight studs on it. And as this wheel rotates, it causes a lever at the back of the clock to lift up and then tip forward, causing the bell at the top of the triforium level to strike. But how many times does the bell strike? Well, this is dictated by the count wheel, which is on the left-hand side of the clock. And as we look at the count wheel, we can see that there are notches in the outside of the wheel. If we look closely, there's 11 notches in the circumference of the wheel, and the distance from one notch to the next notch dictates how many times the bell strikes. So when the iron bar at the back of the clock rotates, it lifts the lever out of the count wheel and the bell starts striking and the bell keeps striking until the lever falls into the next notch. In the same way that the escapement is used to control the rate at which the small weight falls on the driving train, 
A braking mechanism is required on the striking train to control the rate at which the very heavy weight falls. And we can see this mechanism on the left hand side as the wind brake. So as the wheels of the striking train rotate, they cause the wind brake to rotate, causing air resistance and hence reducing the rate at which the very heavy weight falls. So collectively, the striking train and the going train have been in operation for about 650 years, recording time of Salisbury. Now, because we have a new clock in the spire, we don't allow the clock to work on a daily basis, but a couple of times a week, the guides of the cathedral are allowed to connect it all back together and give demonstrations. So we do hope that you'll come along to the cathedral and see the clock in operation.